Hello, good evening. Uh, welcome to everyone joining us online. Um, we're here for our next iteration of uh, our predictions and, and speculations about the 20th Party Congress uh, set to begin in about 10 days time, 11 days time actually. Um, and so today uh, we're really, really happy to welcome uh, Professor Rana Mitter, uh, Professor of History and Politics of China at the University of Oxford, as well as Professor Victor Shi, uh, who is the Ho Myo Lam Chair Professor of China and Asia Pacific Affairs at the University of California, San Diego. And so I thought to get things started off, I might ask each of our panelists to talk for at least a little while, as long as they want really, although hopefully not too long, uh, about three things. So first of all, what do you think the Politburo Standing Committee lineup is going to look like and why? Secondly, why is this party congress different from all other party congresses? You know, if it's, is it the Passover of party congresses in that sense? Um, what is significant about it from a historical or comparative standpoint, such that it is distinct from the previous several party congresses we've seen or, or indeed all others? Uh, and then the third thing is uh, more substantively, do we actually expect anything to change? And, and if so, what might change? What kinds of policy directions might come out of this that, uh, that might be different from what we expect going in? Before I turn things over uh, first to Rana and then to Victor uh, to talk about these things, I also do just want to alert our audience members that if you wish to submit a question, uh, please do so via the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will try to answer all questions that we can at the end of the program, uh, barring time constraints. Uh, and also please do, uh, if you're interested, uh, check us out and subscribe to our website, uh, updates and other mailing list and so on, information on how to do so will appear in the chat. Uh, and so with that, I'll turn things first to Rana, then to Victor to talk about uh, the three topics at hand and anything else they wish to add. Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, thanks very much indeed, Bill. Pleasure as ever to be part of the um, Center for Geopolitics uh, discussion group. And I hope we're due for a very lively interaction this, this evening. Uh, so your first question actually is a challenge that I'm going to slightly duck because we have on the call Victor Shu, who is one of the world's great experts, if not the world's greatest experts in terms of elite Politburo politics in China. So I'm going to give a couple of quick answers to your first question just to show willing uh, but then i expect victor to give a much more detailed answer which will probably disprove everything that i have to to say we all know that until that lineup turns up uh marching onto the stage and great holes of people it's all a black box so it's fun to speculate but some are definitely more informed than others that'll give me a little more time just to say a couple of minutes more on your second two questions which i think do have in the wider scale a great deal of of salience um, but let's have some, uh, you know, some fun at first with the question of who may be the, you know, seven, or maybe nine or maybe five, but probably seven uh, men, again, almost certainly all men who are going to be walking in their black suits onto that stage uh, in just a couple of weeks time. Well, one, of course, and this is the easy one, I suspect, is that the General Secretary of the Communist Party of China clearly is very unlikely to change. Um, if anyone here has inside information that Xi Jinping is not going to take a uh, third term, then you will have pretty much the scoop of the year, and uh, I'd love to hear your reasoning. But for now, it does appear that that is uh, the most likely outcome. So some questions, I think, come in terms of whether people either um, move in or move around uh, within the uh, Politburo. I mean, again, I will just do a couple of these because Victor is definitely more expert, but I'm gonna mention a couple of people um, who are, have been in the news one way or another because of the directions of travel in terms of policy that they may or may not represent. And I'll use that to segue into, into your second question, Bill. Um, so let's take someone like Hu Chunhua, been around for a long time, someone who has quite a lot of provincial experience, including in some pretty hard scrabble places. Some of the public statements he's been making recently are on a subject that is on the one hand, perfectly mainstream within the elite political discourse of China today. But on the other hand, if you want to read it that way, has the potential to seem maybe like a little dig at some of the things holding back China's economy. And that's his speeches about youth unemployment in particular, which is rising up the ranks in terms of one of those issues, particularly graduate unemployment, um, as something that 
is not going to cause the sudden collapse of the Chinese system. It's always exciting to talk about these things, but frankly, that's not usually the way that these things work, but rather a slow erosion eating away at some of the certainties of economic progression that previous generations have been able to, to be given. And Hu Chunhua has made a little bit of a splash by making some speeches suggesting that this may be the way to uh, uh, an area to, to pay attention to. His speech, like others, of course, has to be taken in the context of uh, a little like Harry Potter and Lord Voldemort, you know, you have uh, he who must not be named. So in this case, it's the policy that must not be named, and that is zero COVID. In other words, the idea that if current zero COVID constrictions, restrictions um, were lifted soon, then this would affect a whole variety of areas like consumer confidence, small and medium enterprises being able to take off. And that, again, would have a significant effect on um, some of the bottlenecks in employment. One other name out there, and this is, again, even more speculative than the last one, um, for some time now, already sitting on that uh, number, on that seven man top table um, is uh, Wang Yang, someone who, again, has a pretty storied career when it comes to, well, two things. One is association with markets. And we all know, I think, you know, but well, people on this call, many of them will have some experience of China and markets have always been managed markets. They've always been socialist markets. But even within that context, you do have the breadth of um, space for operation that Guangdong province, particularly under people like Wang Yang, um, have been given in the in the past. And also even more as a survivor. Um, again, uh, I'm going to take correction from Bill and from Victor on this, but I think Wang Yang may be the only recent party secretary of Chongqing who hasn't ended up in jail, which you know suggests a capacity of, apart from the current incumbent, to be to be fair. Um, but you know, of the last four, I guess you know two have basically fallen pretty fast. Um, and in that context, being able to make your way through a very difficult selection of political choices over two decades or so suggests as a survivor instinct that someone like Wang Yang may yet show, you know, has the capacity to go even further, maybe from number five up to number two. So we'll see. Um, let me spend the last couple of minutes that I, I have um, moving on from people to policies. Is this different? Well, this is where having a historian on the call, I guess, may be you know, useful in some ways. I mean, in some ways, people are talking about this party congress as being a transformative one, not least because of the increasing embeddedness of Xi Jinping in top uh, uh, top in constitution writing, or at least being written into the constitution, and in terms of top level policy. I have to say in comparative perspective, uh, party congresses held in Yan'an back in the 40s, or indeed during the Cultural Revolution, probably really take the prize for total overturning of the, uh, um, uh, uh, the existing status uh, quo. But in the reform era, I think it's fair to say this one has real um, significance. The continuing embeddedness of Xi Jinping as core leader, as someone who much more personalistically is being associated with a series of different um, uh, leadership credentials is, I think, clearly a different tone, either from, of course, the eras of Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, or certainly Xi's first Congress, and even the second one in 2017, the 19th Party uh, Party Congress. So I think we see a concentration, uh, a distillation, almost, you might say, of that kind of atmosphere. And let me finish off by talking about Bill's last question, when anything change? I think some things will change inevitably, regardless of what happens at the Congress. And those are long-term directions of travel for, let's say, the next five to 10 years. So let me leave you with a couple of bullet points on those, and maybe it'll be for others in the Q&A to, to pick them up. I think that there will be changes which will be rolled out, perhaps implicitly, but sooner than later, explicitly, that stem from China's demographic crisis, which you know we know from this year's statistics is even more severe in various ways than had previously been thought. That means changes to things like pension policies. It means changes in terms of healthcare provision. And actually, observers will have seen that China's healthcare sector is one of the ones that's come under particular scrutiny in the last few um, months. Uh, beyond that, I think it's fair to say that that youth unemployment question is something that is causing eyebrows to rise at top levels. And the question of how you create genuine um, growth in high value sectors continues to be of importance. And in practical terms, what does that mean? Well, I'd look out for things like the Greater Bay Area integration of Hong Kong, uh, much more into that region, you know, new tech and EVs being produced 
produced in Foshan and in Shenzhen. Hong Kong is a big pool of capital down south. Does that mean more of a place for a big Guangdong figure, a figure who's been in Guangdong, who's not actually a Guangdong himself, um, like Wang Yang, you know, who can say, but over time, that direction of travel in terms of the socioeconomics is um, important. And finally, in regional and global terms, I wouldn't expect to see a statement on Taiwan making anything more than a version, perhaps a more confrontational version of the current status quo. But I think the indication that it remains a key issue will certainly be made. And beyond that, I think fleshing out in some ways the Global Security Initiative, not quite the successor to BRI, but certainly a, um, a, gener a product generated from the BRI um, atmosphere, that is something that I think we'll hear more about and will involve not only, I think, um, discussions of areas such as China's changing relationship with the Global South, but also begin to talk much more about ungoverned spaces, cyberspace, and outer space. So if you're looking for a space age China, the 20th Congress may well be the first place to start. Let's just hope that in the midst of that, we don't see any CCP cadres who turn out to be space cadets. I'll throw it back to you, Bill. All right. Thanks very much for that. I I've, I've definitely have some, some follow-up uh, points and questions on some of that. Uh, but before I get to that, let me turn things to Victor uh, to get his take on those sort of three issues. And then, then I'll come in with some additional follow-ups and uh, uh, sort of uh, redirect to it's more of a discussion, but uh, go ahead, Victor. Uh, yeah, no, uh, it's very hard to follow Rana uh, because, of course, his insights are always uh, very brilliant. Um, on very quickly on Chongqing, I, uh, there was one exception. Uh, Zhang Dejiang was Chongqing Party Secretary for like you know six months or something like that before he entered the Politburo Standing Committee, and he he ended up fine. Uh, um, but yes, Chongqing is not especially a uh, lucky place for senior Chinese officials, um, as history has shown. Um, so in terms of the personnel uh, at the Politburo Standing Committee level uh, at the 20th Party Congress, complete black box, we're all guessing here. Um, well, so um, if so, what really matters here is whether this norm of 67, you get to stay. 68 uh you have to retire which of course is a very new norm it did not come into being until the 16th party congress when um Jiang Zemin basically used that as an excuse to force Li Ruihuan to retire along with himself you know he had to step down he didn't want Li Ruihuan to continue another term in the Politburo standing committee so he sort of instituted uh that rule I believe with the help of um, Bo Yibo, actually Bo Xilai's father, so one of the last major political things that uh, he did in his life. Uh, and more or less, you know, the leadership has stuck to that rule uh, with a couple of exceptions, mainly in the PLA, um, but uh, well, and, and also for the Secretary General, of course. Um, uh, so if that rule is adhered to, then actually the vast majority of the Politburo Standing Committee would remain in their place because Li Keqiang, Wang Yang, and Wang Huning are all 67. Uh, according to the rule, they shouldn't have to retire. The only two people who would have to retire uh, would be Han Zheng and Li Zhanshu. Um, and I expect, so, you know, basically everyone else would stay in this scenario, you know, Xi Jinping, uh, Li Keqiang, Wang Yang, Zhao Luoji, uh, Wang Huning, they would all stay. Um, the two people who would get inducted into the Politburo Standing Committee uh, would be Ding Xiang, who, of course, is currently head of the general office of the Central Committee, previously Xi Jinping's private secretary in Shanghai, um, apparently very much trusted by Xi Jinping. Um, so then I would expect him, who's, and he, interestingly, is also slightly younger, not so young as to make him kind of a successor material, uh, especially given that she's going to serve the full five-year term, uh, at least that's what we expect uh, after the 20th Party Congress, um, but young enough so that Ding can s serve in the Politburo Standing Committee for two uh, five-year terms before he would reach uh, kind of retirement age. Um, so he would be an ideal person to put in there if uh, she wanted a reliable person at his right hand for the next 10 years. Uh, the other person, actually, I, I still uh, am 
kind of uh, uh, up on Li Qiang, despite, of course, a lot of grumbling about him in Shanghai, his performance in Shanghai, but the you know rolling lockdown and then eventually full lockdown, uh, his relationship um, with Xi Jinping also is a very close one. He was Xi's uh, personal secretary in Zhejiang province. Um, and apparently, you know, he gained Xi's trust, um, enjoyed a rapid series of promotions when she became um, secretary general in 2012, culminating to his appointment as the Shanghai party secretary and a Politburo member. Shanghai, as we know, um, economically is still extremely important for China. Also, politically, is a very tricky place. There, uh, a lot of residual influence of Jiang Zemin, obviously. So you really wanted to, uh, he really wanted to put someone he trusts uh, in Shanghai, and that person is uh, Li Qiang. Um, and so the other thing is like promoting Li Qiang would follow the Han Zheng route, right? So Han Zheng was party secretary of Shanghai, became executive vice premier. Han Zheng has to retire, so someone has to step in. Uh, it's quite natural to, you know, appoint Li Qiang in that position to be the executive vice premier in charge of the economy. So if that's the scenario, then Wang Yang indeed would be the next premier of China, serving a five-year term before he retires. Li Keqiang already said that he will no longer be the premier of China. He said that publicly. Um, so we know it's going to be someone else. Uh, the other alternative, if she wanted to flex his muscle, is to force Wang Yang and Li Keqiang into retirement. Um, in which case, um, then more uh, of his followers can be promoted into the Politburo Standing Committee. I think um, the most likely people would be um, Huang Kunming um, and also, so Chen Xi is too old. Uh, Huang Kunming is fine. Uh, Chen Minar is a possibility. The other person is Li Xi, who's party secretary of Guangdong, who comes out of the northwestern China side of Xi Jinping's faction. Uh, so I think, you know, for internal factional balancing, he could appoint Li Xi. Li Xi is very interesting because his faction actually is the largest one in the party today, <laughs> according to my calculation, which makes him a bit of a tricky figure to, to sort of promote uh, because, of course, he's very loyal to Xi Jinping, but numerically, you know, he has a very large faction, which makes it interesting. Um, but in even in that kind of scenario where she seeks to have dominance, I think um, it's in his interest to promote someone like Wu Chunhua into the Politburo Standing Committee, either as the executive vice premier or as the premier of China, because uh, there, as Rana, you know, suggested already, there are many economic headwinds facing China. Um, some unpleasant things will happen in the next five years. And I think it's advantageous for Xi to have someone not in his faction in charge or sort of in charge of uh, major aspects of the economy so that they can be blamed if things were to go south. Um, that's a very cynical thought, I know, <laughs> but uh, you know, Chinese politics is quite cynical. Uh, so in terms of, you know, what's uh, different about this Congress, uh, a couple of things. One is that this, of course, would be the first Congress that will vote a secretary general into a full third term um, since the death of Mao. So for Jiang Zemin, uh, he almost served three full terms, but not quite because uh, he was not appointed secretary general at the 13th Party Congress. Uh, he came in halfway through the 13th. He was appointed the, uh, Secretary General 14th and 15th, uh, but so he basically served two and a half terms as Secretary General, uh, but this Congress would be the first one since the death of Mao to uh, vote Secretary General in for a full third term, uh, and that does indeed break the precedent set since the death of Mao. The other, the other thing that's interesting is that, of course, um, every leader in the party has tried to enshrine, well, every leader since 1949, I would say, um, has tried to enshrine their ideology into the party constitution. Um, usually they just do it once, uh, at least since the death of Mao, they would just enshrine their ideology into the party constitution once. Um, Jiang Zemin did this, you know, Hu Jintao did it. Uh, usually they do it in the halfway point, um, you know, before the retirement. 
um, Xi Jinping did it at the 19th Party Congress already, but uh, it looks like from the People's Daily and other media that his thoughts will be further reinforced in the party constitution yet again at this party congress. There's going to be something called the the two language the two uh, establishment or something like that. Um, so. So um, that is quite a bit of Xi Jinping content that will be added uh, into the party constitution. Uh, some would see this as a personality cult, which uh, interestingly, the party constitution still, um, you know, forbids. Uh, but of course, this is not a personality cult officially within China. Um, so, so there is some interest, interesting development there. And then the third part, I, I don't think this is likely, but potentially is that Xi's title may change officially. Um, I really don't think it's going to happen at this party Congress There's maybe 10% chance, um, more likely at the next, next party Congress, his title will be loftier, you know, chairman or, uh, the leader, you know, Renmin Xiao, people's leader. And then the nitty gritty of managing the party would might be delegated to someone else, you know, as either um, the first secretary of the secretariat or even, you know, uh, secretary general, but uh, understood as a purely party administrative position instead of a leadership sort of position. Um, so who knows? Um, in terms of policies, I very much agree with Rana. Um, you know, uh, external policies will be fleshed out, growth is a big concern. Um, one thing I would say is that you have to look at things from the perspective of Xi Jinping. I, I think um, a lot of the political work report will be celebrating the successes of the past 10 years, right? So we had the resolution on history already late last year. From Xi Jinping's perspective, um, almost everything he has done has been a great success. Um, you know, reforming the PLA, getting rid of corruption, those two being objectively just very big reshuffling within the party uh, that no one else uh, had done since the death of Mao. Um, cleansing China's media of all sort of uh, undesirable tendencies, you know, from the perspective of the party, very successful. Um, making sure that private entrepreneurs tow the party line, making sure that they have less autonomy, that um, is a very desirable outcome from the perspective of the party and from Xi Jinping's perspective. So, so I think that uh, a lot of what we will see will be consolidation of the existing gains. Uh, but then, of course, on the margin, they do need to make changes because of you know population, economic growth, uh, foreign affairs. Uh, that's, that's all I'll say for now. Wow, this is really great. Um, there's a lot of things that we can talk further about. Uh, a couple of points that I might just raise um, related to what each of you has said. Um, I mean, I think on one level, um, is it really feasible? Let's talk first about the personnel issue. Is it really feasible, let's say, for Li Keqiang to remain on the Politburo Standing Committee after he leaves uh, the premiership? Right. Is this something that he can do? Uh, is it something he wants to do? Is it something that's feasible if he becomes, for example, uh, chair of the National People's Congress, uh, which maybe he would, or if he continues without a state brief uh, and is purely a party official, as say number three uh, or number two in the Politburo um, hierarchy? Is that feasible? Is that workable? Is that desirable from, from his point of view or from Xi Jinping's point of view? The second point would be. Um, if we don't see a great deal of turnover uh, in the ranks of the Politburo Standing Committee, that might be an indication that, in fact, there's little attempt to plan for succession, um, which would then indicate, perhaps, that we're looking at not just a third term, but likely a fourth, maybe the fourth with this elevated but somewhat hollowed out title uh, attached to it uh, for the great leader. Uh, or the core leader, or the people's leader, or whatever sort of leader Xi Jinping styles himself to be uh, after the 21st Party Congress. Um, but also then, I like the idea of naming a prime minister who's not in your faction, 
to deal with some of these thorny issues. Uh, and I, I do agree that, that that seems more likely than not, um, so that somebody can take the fall or take the blame uh, if indeed things go poorly. Uh, and if things go well, then that may also be a way of winning over members of that faction. Um, so I think the one question on that is, so what happens to Li Keqiang? Um, is he likely to be retained in the Politburo or not? Uh, and if not, uh, is, is he the only one along with Li Jianshu to go? Um, or do we see a full turnover and what does that really portend? Uh, a second question then about sort of policy stuff would be, I mean, youth unemployment, I agree, is a huge issue, but it's been a huge issue for 20 years at least, right? And it, it, it's not getting better, but at least I'm not convinced that it's getting that much worse. And so one question around that would be, is that really the sort of fulcrum of where policy is likely to turn on the economy? Or is it just a convenient foil because it's always a convenient foil to bring up as something that, that then calling for greater attention to sort of social uh, equity or social protection uh, of one kind or another, because it's easier to talk about that than it is to talk about certain other uh, political and economic problems that affect various segments of society. Um, and so also then on this, this global security initiative, and I had quite a good talk uh, the other day uh, with somebody else about, about this as well, uh, and whether it's in some ways a distraction from the belt tightening on the Belt and Road, um, where basically you know, China is saying, essentially we're done with this policy we've been pursuing for 10 years, uh, we're gonna pull back on this, but then you know, disguise this sort of retreat uh, or semi-retreat by saying now we're advancing on a different front uh, without really paying much attention to, to retreating on the first. So there could be some of that in there. I wonder if there are any other areas where we could expect to see real policy shifts. Healthcare would be very interesting, but I'm not sure what a healthcare policy shift would look like uh, if the resources are there, if the political will is really there. And the only last thing I would say is that what's interesting in a sense about this party Congress and historical perspective is that we've fallen into a pattern over the last 45 years of having a party Congress every five years. But of course, it wasn't always that way, right? I mean, there were something like six or seven party Congresses in the 1920s alone, right? And then nothing until 1945. And then 1956, 69, 73, sort of whenever there, there might be until we get to 77. And then every, every five years since 1977, we've seen a party Congress. And so is that going to continue? If we're seeing a completely different kind of leadership and different kind of elite politics in the party, why continue to have the party Congress every five years? Why not have it every year or every 15 years or whenever anybody feels like it? Um, there might be some shift there. And if there isn't a shift, then maybe it is something new. If not since 1977, I would argue since at least 1992, maybe since 1982, in that what we're now seeing is much less of a regularized transition at the top. But I would also question whether we're seeing something qualitatively new in terms of policy direction shifts. Because if we look at some of those earlier ones, 1982, 1987, 1992, 1997, I mean, there's massive shifts and reorientation in economic and social policy at each of those, right? 1977, not so much until you get to his third plenum uh, a year and a half later. But, you know, might there be actually less of a policy um, change coming here and more change in sort of the way things are done? So just some, some questions for each of you in whichever order you want to take those. Oh, yeah, I guess I can uh, jump in very quickly. Um, so on Li Keqiang, I, I think there's a lot of precedence for premiers or other people serving in sort of more powerful positions to transition into an NPC chairman position or a CPPCC position. So Li Peng obviously did this. Um, so uh, Li Keqiang can be the next NPC chairman. I th but what is significant here is that of course, uh, these Politburo Standing Committee members, they have their official state positions, uh, but then also informally or within the party, they also are in charge of a larger portfolio of policies. 
So Li Zhengshu, because he's trusted by Xi Jinping, um, he is, you know, in charge of the legal apparatus in China, um, and including legal reform. So there's a leading group on legal reform. Uh, I think the official head is still Xi Jinping, but, you know, Li Zhengshu sort of runs the day to day. Um, but what Xi Jinping can do is to make Li Keqiang the head of the NPC, but then not give him any of the other portfolios. Right. So he would only run the NPC as an institution, but not have a role, not have a leading role, at least in legal reform uh, as head of the legal reform leading group, um, et cetera. So so certainly his power can be hollowed out, even if he stays in the Politburo Standing Committee, even if he becomes the head of the NPC. Um, yeah, so on uh, a lot of these uh, policy changes, um, yeah, there, there are massive problems in China. I, and and I one thing that I'm afraid of is that the how policy making is done today, which is, you know, whatever Xi Jinping wants immediately becomes policy. Um, and if there are problems that are emerging, they would have to be very big problems before there's a reaction to it. Uh, that's not really going to serve China well in the next five to 10 years. The demographic issue is very urgent. Uh, the economic headwinds China is facing is very urgent, especially now that the rest of the world is slowing down. So for the past two years, export obviously has been a pretty important engine of growth in China. That engine is going to slow down uh, this coming year because, you know, the U.S. is slowing down. Europe is slowing down dramatically. Uh, so their ability to buy Chinese goods is going to be diminished. Um, so, you know, basically top level policymaking has to be a lot more reactive. And, and I'm not sure that whoever, get, you know, becomes the next premier of China, the reaction function is just not going to be especially fast because people don't want to offend Xi Jinping. Uh, and this problem could just get worse and worse over time uh, as she gets older and, you know, uh, less uh, clear headed, I guess. Uh, this is, of course, not an immediate problem. I'm saying sort of 10, 20 years from now. I also agree with you, Bill, that it's going to be a lifetime 10 year situation. Uh, we have this uh, not especially great example of between the eighth party Congress and the ninth party Congress, as you pointed out, this kind of 13 year gap. I don't think we'll see this uh, at least until after the 21st Party Congress. So I, I do believe that we will have five years and then 21st Party Congress. After that, I think that's when things get very interesting, you know, because uh, she, you know, is going to get older. Um, he will have to start thinking about the successor issue. Uh, as we know from the Mao period, uh, which, you, you know, of course, you can read all about in my new book, <laughs> Coalitions of the Week, the late Mao period, the succession politics just got incredibly messy. And Mao has had to do, um, you know, from a kind of an institutionalization perspective, uh, not especially good policies on that front to keep himself in power, just uh, appointing very weak figures to the top. Uh, rendering a lot of formal institutions um, in stasis, uh, et cetera. So, so I think after the 21st Party Congress is when things get really interesting. I'll stop there. No, I think that is quite interesting uh, as a prediction that uh, a, a staying on past the 22nd Party Congress, if it were held in uh, 2032, might be a bridge too far, that implies, right? So that then then maybe it is in the interest of someone looking to stay on permanently and to keep the succession game in suspense to forego a five yearly party congress or, or to prorogue uh, the party congress in a sense uh, and just leave it sort of sitting vacant uh, for some time after that uh, until such time as it's more convenient to call one i actually hadn't thought about that that'd be rather interesting uh, if that were to occur, obviously we won't know that for another five years. But although to be fair, ten years from now he will be Biden's age. So that's true, and and quite a bit younger than Mahathir Mohammed when he came back as Prime Minister of Malaysia. Um, so, and and younger than uh, you know Deng Xiaoping when he really faded from the scene uh, in a meaningful way after after uh, the early nineteen nineties. 
So let me turn things now to Rana to see what his response is to, to some of this. Sure, absolutely. Well, I will certainly about a Victor and to, to you as well, Bill, in, in terms of the kind of internal politics of who maybe kind of gets to move up and down. But I think the NPC answer just saying that seems like a very logical one in terms of where you find a prestigious but essentially relatively less um, potent post to put um, a grandee, as I guess we would call them in the British uh, political uh, system. We could use that for China too. Let me um, instead just say a couple of things about the other points that uh, Bill uh, raised. I mean, first of all, um, well, first of all, I completely agree about the uh, the BRI. I mean, I don't think it's quite dead, but the turn away essentially from funding it in the way that it happened over the past 10 years or so, essentially moving away from big um, loans that have little prospect of being um, uh, fulfilled uh, to something that is much more directed and much more investment oriented and needs returns relatively quickly is clearly not the same deal that was being offered a few years ago. And anyway, Global Security Initiative turns to a whole variety of things which I think are again very much on the minds of policymakers. Um, in the next few years, including the regulation of cyberspace, um, internet sovereignty and other issues. You know, when China talks about global security, it is talking very much about the uh, proliferation of different models of national security across the uh, un relatively ungoverned space of the internet and is using, as we, we are aware, um, its capacity to fill posts in international organizations where that's relevant I, International Telecommunications Union being one of them to try and fulfill those goals. So I'd certainly see uh, more of that uh, coming about. Youth unemployment, why is it different? I mean, at some level, yes, you're absolutely right that, you know, this is something that's been going a long time. I think the following things may be different. I, I just use the word may because I think there's so much still that's, that's to be seen. First of all, as with so many other things in China, I think social media has changed things because it's created an echo chamber in which people are able to reflect to each other. Something like the lying flat movement, uh, you know, Tangping would have been not impossible, but I think very difficult to achieve in a society where you didn't have the fast media, social media based capacity to spread what is essentially a political message by another name. Now, we know that there are a whole variety of censorship constraints that means that such movements are snuffed out pretty quickly. We also know that, you know, even if we're not in kind of the, the days of uh, whatever it was about 10 years ago with the classic article by Gary King and others um, on how China's internet works, I mean, it has become significantly less liberal than then. Nonetheless, China's internet, you know, obvious statement worth saying is still not North Korea's internet. Even North Korea's internet actually is becoming a little more open in some ways, but, you know, still a long way to go. But the capacity of the authorities still to use a certain amount of permissiveness on social media to see what's brewing. I hesitate to draw a very direct line between Hu Chunhua's speech, um, or indeed actually speeches by Li Keqiang, who's also spoken about it, about this issue, and the widespread anomie of youth uh, expressed through social media. But I think the idea that these things are unconnected is, um, you know, also a stretch. Just as the continuing and frankly rather odd obsession of the propaganda department of the party with talking about, you know, kind of effeminate boys and, you know, the, the breakdown of masculinity in China, which has become a kind of obsessive theme in, in some of the propaganda recently. Also, I think, links to these, you know, longstanding ideas that frankly go back to the Qing dynasty, if not before, of a supposed link between the strength of the body national and the strength of the body personal. I'm, I'm reminded in some ways of the... Uh, classic response uh, either of uh, Mao Zedong as, as I think here many here will know that historically pretty much the, almost the first piece of writing we have from Mao Zedong preserved from his youth is not in fact writing about Marxism or anarchism but a personal exercise plan which uh, he had sketched out at that um, uh, at that time so you know these long-standing uh, cultural connections, uh, which spiritual civilization, of course, is a term that's often used to try and uh, encompass them, and of course, spiritual pollution as its as its opposite. All of that, I think, is very real, and I think what's different is that youth unemployment fits into that scenario culturally. It also fits in again economically. Youth unemployment matters more in this sort of transition to a new type of demographic world, because in a weird way, China is in the worst possible of two worlds at the moment, in that it's got high overly high level of youth unemployment, but it also has an increasingly demanding 
elder population, which is going to need working youths who are earning to actually pay into those near bankrupt uh, pension schemes. Although they could try also raising the pension age from, you know, 50 to 55 and 55 to, to, to 60 to deal with uh, uh, with some of that. So anyway, yeah, it's it's a step change. It's not, you know, I think you're right, falling off a cliff, but it is a definite step change in terms of what it is and why it um, why it matters. And the final thought about, you know, why have the Congress every five years? Again, it's very speculative, but I, I, I suspect it probably will be kept. And I think the reason is this. I think it will be kept for the same reason, actually, that although China doesn't do it, most one party authoritarian and socialist states, even during the Cold War, regularly had elections. Uh, Poland did, Hungary did, most of those things, even though there's any essentially one party or some satellite parties that could take part. And it was to do, I think, with the creation of a political cycle that would still have recognizable contours, even at a time when the political choice on offer was limited to, to zero. I wouldn't be surprised if, I mean, it's a little like Putin in the sense, I mean, we know, I think, collectively that the Russian political system is not comparable today to the Chinese party-based system. But one element is interesting, you know, Putin could essentially declare himself czar for life if he wants, perhaps he will do before he's he, he's over. But for him, clear legitimacy, even of deeply, deeply flawed and rigged elections on a regular cycle has mattered. And I wouldn't bet against the idea of a regular cycle of party con uh, um, uh, party congresses, bearing in mind that although Xi Jinping maybe is the, the, the supreme leader, um, there are plenty of other leaders also in Chinese politics who also want sense of, of cycling. Even if you don't get to be top leader because it's a lifetime tenure, as Victor has, uh, has, has pointed out, you still have to keep shifting the prime minister. You still have to keep shifting the Politburo. Maybe, maybe one day they'll have a woman in the top seven. Maybe they'll even have two. You know, these sorts of things, I think. Um, maybe they'll have an ethnic minority. You know, all of these things, I think, sit there in that realm of possibilities that become harder if you never rotate what happens at the top. I think that's very fair. I mean, one one slight um, wrinkle to that that occurs to me, though, is Putin doesn't have the party, right? So in that sense, he needs elections more than Xi um, in that he doesn't have the legitimacy of the Communist Party behind him. But the party gains its legitimacy in part from being seen to be at least supposedly a rational actor that has its yes. own cycles and patterns and a party that never renews itself in any formal sense, I think would probably lose some of that legitimacy. Well, and also it would have strayed very far from the mass line if it was really just a sort of fortress party inside uh, its own organization department. Yeah, and none of yeah. us can do that. No, um, least of all Xi Jinping, actually, from, from what he says publicly and has been saying for some time. Uh, he cares very deeply about the mass line. Um, we don't seem to have any questions yet in the Q&A box uh, or in the chat that I can see. Um, if there are any questions from uh, attendees, it would be very useful to post those now to us. Um, if there are not, I'll just kind of return to sort of the big question then from the beginning, which is, how is this party Congress actually different from all other party Congresses? I don't really feel that we've answered that, uh, at least not satisfactorily uh, to me, that you know we're likely to see sort of continued tenure for most of those at the top. We're likely not to see huge policy shifts we're likely, it seems, to see party congresses sticking to the five yearly clock, at least for now. Is there really anything so special about this? Or, or is this actually kind of run of the mill, except the general secretary staying on a bit longer than his recent predecessors have? Any thought on that? I think that there's a danger, perhaps, of conflating the fact of the changing of the guard at, at the five year intervals with the much longer horizons on which many of these policy changes are taking place. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, everything from what should we do about Taiwan to what should we do about our aging population is actually a set of things which, you know, again, this grouping will know, um, is debated in a variety of places from the NDRC to the party school over time. Again, mostly, sadly, these days, even more in a black box than, than, yeah. uh, than usual. And therefore, the Congress is really more the culmination of these debates rather than the place of initiation. That's why I've been saying to people who've been asking about this, I don't know if you two would share this, this view that you shouldn't be looking to the Congress to actually say something surprising or new. What it is useful for potentially is a readout that suggests 
what elements that we already know about have been consolidated or mm. possibly given, you know, kind of a little bit of extra go juice. And I think you have things like international strategy and, and uh, Taiwan strategy here, but there could be other things um, as well. So to some extent, your characterization, I think, yeah, that's exactly, uh, exactly right. It may be looking for the wrong thing to expect that the Congress is the place where something very surprising is likely to happen. Oh, I think that's very fair, although I would point to a couple of recent counterexamples, mm -hmm. uh, the 14th Party Congress and the 15th in 1992 and 1997, respectively, at yeah. which really significant shifts were announced in social and economic policy, for example. But 1992, of course, was the first Congress, if I have it right, after 1989, when yes, the party was. had it, essentially... Arguing that it was business as usual in 1992 would have actually been rather a radical step in its own its True. own right. It was the necessity to kind of grab the nettle and then actually sort of move the the operation in a different uh, uh, a different direction. I uh, I think. Mm. Fair enough. Okay, yeah. Victor, did you have any thoughts on any of this? Um, no. Well, I I still think the fact that he gets appointed the third term, the fact that constitution will change once again adding more of his ideas, really um, uh, more, even more decisively than previous uh, development to shift the orientation of the party. So in the 1980s, uh, as we all remember, there was a genuine effort to get the party away from the cult of personality. Yeah. Because the elite at the time saw that as a really a very dangerous thing for the party and that norm had been maintained uh definitely through the 1980s definitely through the 1990s uh and through the 2010s because Hu Jintao was in charge and obviously he experimented with inter party democracy and and you know direct elections at the township level etc cetera, etc cetera. um these experimentation of course didn't go very far uh, but still there, there was uh definitely momentum uh some of my friends were involved with that um, but going into the Xi Jinping era, um, clearly, you know, of course, the, the era of uh, power sharing had a lot of problems, you know, the corruption, yeah. the independent kingdoms that had developed within the regime, you know, where these elites would just go out and do their own thing. This is, of course, uh, described, by the way, in great details in my colleague Susan Shirk's new, mm -hmm. new book, uh, Overreach. Um, so there are these problems, but Xi Jinping, uh, in his quest to consolidate control in the party, also decisively turned his back against this fear uh, or this resistance against the cult of personality. I think this party congress will, um, you know, even more so than previous development, uh, finally turn the party completely away from this notion of power sharing, from this fear of cult of personality, and really inaugurate um, an unconstrained, um, I don't want to say worshipping, but, you know, unconstrained uh, ideological and organizational uh, leadership dominance by Xi Jinping. Mm. I don't know if you agree with that. Anna. I, I'm not sure if I agree fully with that, although that would indeed be a major shift if that is fully achieved, right? Uh, that in and of itself. I mean, the only other small point I'd point out with reference to Hu Jintao, for example, one has to have a personality around which to build a cult. And I'm not sure that he really did. So, you know, that, that if, 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 you're, if you have zero charisma, in other words, it's hard to be a charismatic leader. Uh, but... You know, Xi Jinping certainly is is moving very far in the direction of of turning back towards what might be considered a cult of personality. And if indeed we do get to a highly, highly personalized leadership style uh, being fully entrenched, that would indeed be a, a major shift in and of itself, perhaps even larger uh, than the significant uh, economic shifts uh, in monetary and fiscal reform that came out of the 14th Party Congress uh, or in the reorganization of state-owned enterprises uh, and uh, the state-owned enterprise workforce that comes out of the 15th Party Congress. Uh, we have two questions uh, now from the audience, so let's at least try to answer these two. Uh, the first is from Ming Du, um, which says, do you expect to see China changing its zero COVID policy, cracking down on big tech companies, and probably toning down its global ambition? 
Also, there are rumors that C will have to give up one of his top positions at the 20th Party Congress because of internal party resistance, including from Jiang Zemin. Do you see any credibility of these rumors? Um, I can um, I can answer the first part. And maybe Victor would like to answer the second part because I must say, uh, factional knowledge is not something on which I claim any expertise. Um, so, in terms of uh, do I expect expect China turning down its global ambition? The answer is absolutely no. Um, on zero COVID, I think that. The problem is this, and I'm actually genuinely not quite sure how they come through it. I mean, first of all, as many people have pointed out, zero COVID is personally associated with Xi Jinping. But I think that actually means that because of that, if he chooses to change it with a certain amount of you know careful management of propaganda, that can be done. A large part of the problem is virological because, for reasons that are well known, Western Moderna, Pfizer, mRNA vaccines have not been used in, in China, and the population is not um, well immunized, hasn't had any herd immunity, and particularly older people in China continue to be very vulnerable because they haven't had it going through to that part of the population either. And China has it keeps on promising it's going to produce its own highly effective mRNA vaccines. And, you know, there's been a lot of money put into it. People have put shares into a lot of companies, CanSino and others, which have be looking into it but they haven't yet i think actually got the magic bullet on that on that front and if they do it will take time to um uh immunize a large part of the population all of that suggests a strategy that means that even if you do have significant loosening of the rules maybe shorter quarantine or, or whatever um that this is something that's going to be hanging around well through 2023 and possibly beyond that too and that will continue to have a an effect on the economy even if the policy isn't just about shutting down everything in any township where you see um COVID happening um you know internet i mean just to give one specific example and you know international business executives like to fly places be there for two days get their stuff done and go they're not going to sit i mean saying that the quarantine goes down from 10 days to five days in many cases is still going to be a deterrent and it may be in some cases a political gesture saying well we don't need you guys here but all the same china will be sitting in a very different sort of um relationship everywhere else in the world uh you know unless there's a sort of second wave of covid that really does you know change the change the game right now china is in a very very isolated position in terms of its policy and um i think it's going to be tough to to get out of uh, of that maybe the other two have some ideas of how to how to do it but i can't see an immediate pathway um yeah so i agree with rana um that China continues to have a lot of ambition for its tech companies overseas, but a lot of things that it has done, uh, even before zero COVID, uh, de facto constrained the ability of Chinese tech companies to grant market shares overseas, um, including a lot of these anti-monopoly moves, uh, the crackdown, of course, you know, uh, stopping the Ant Finance IPO. Uh, because for a lot of these companies, their big advantage had been the fact that they could um, have these oligopolistic advantages within mainland China, uh, reap a decent profit from that, and then plow the profit into overseas expansion. Uh, but by limiting a lot of these tech companies in China, um, these companies are making less money in China now, and that has limited their ability to invest overseas and to grab market share overseas. Of, of course, they're still very aggressive. They still do the best to, to try to grab market share, especially in Southeast Asia. You know, Indonesia is a big battleground kind of country right now for uh, both Western and Chinese tech companies. Um, but, you know, a lot of things that China are doing uh, is, is a bit counterproductive of its own aim of achieving global technology supremacy. Uh, in terms of the rumors of she having to give up, I just don't believe it. You know, you just look at leverage, right? So typically, what are the big leverages within the regime? You control the military, you control internal security, or you have some deep, dark, you know, uh, secret that you can hold over the head of someone else. Um, Jiang Zemin no longer controls the military because there's been uh, extensive purge of the military. All of his people are now purged. Uh, Jiang Zemin doesn't control internal security. Uh, Zhou Yongkang controlled it. All, all of the non-Xi Jinping people have been purged from the top, you know, at least top level in the system. Um, deep dark secret 
all of them have been leaked already in various ways. Or really, I struggle to think of any deep, dark secret of Xi Jinping that would not result in a mere shrug by the vast majority of Chinese people and by foreigners. So given the lack of leverage, you know, all of these rumors like, oh, a coup or like, oh, people are forcing him to do this and that. I, I just don't see it. Um, so I'll stop there. OK, no, I, I would agree with both of what, uh, with what both of you have said. Uh, Rana's points about zero COVID and uh, the lack of zero COVID going away anytime soon and the issues preventing it from going away uh, are points I've heard him make before. They're points I've made before as well um, in, in various forms. Uh, and so, yes, I, I think that logic is, is uh, very solid. Uh, Victor's point about uh, Xi Jinping not going anywhere, I also agree with. Uh, I don't think there's much credibility to these rumors. Uh, and in that vein, actually, there's one more question uh, related to such rumors, uh, which says from uh, Hin Tak Leong, uh, who asks, uh, Jiang Zemin is 96 and just a few months younger than the Queen. What change do you think will happen if he passes on? And how would it happen? And other comments? I like that if in the sentence. They know something maybe <laughs> that's capacity to go on and on. Um, I think that's really one for Victor, though. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, Sung Ping is like 105 mm -hmm. and he's out there. So, you know, we we're cheering for Jiang Zemin to, you know, achieve uh, Sung Ping's age. Uh, no, I, I think his passing would be mainly kind of symbolic um, and the final passing of someone who, you know, actually I uh, wrote uh, ahead of time, his his uh, obituary for foreign affairs. They were like, oh, you know, who knows when it's going to happen? We want to have something. Mm. And what I basically wrote was that um, he really helped um, navigate China from the age of revolutionary giants, right? So these first generation mm. revolutionaries who uh, then engage in decades of political infighting, uh, resulting in decades of political instability in China. He really navigate the entire country and the party from this age of instability into an age of power sharing and relative stability and, and economic prosperity. Um, and now that legacy is, uh, a lot of that is in the garbage. I mean, of course, now China is you know, the second largest economy of the world. Uh, economic growth continues to be positive. So economically, you know, obviously China continues to do relatively speaking fairly well compared to other developing countries. But uh, this norm of power sharing, um, building up party institutions, um, a lot of that has gone by the wayside uh, in this mm. new era. Okay, fair enough. Um, there are two final questions uh, on the floor. Uh, that I'd like to po I'll pose both of them to you because they're rather unrelated questions from, from different sets of uh, issues. Uh, the first is from uh, James Farquharson, uh, who asks, why is Xi, in all likelihood, able so easily to sideline Li Keqiang? Uh, and more generally speaking, how is power contested among different Politburo members, or indeed between Politburo members and the leaders, as far as we can tell? Uh, and so that's one question. The other question is from Jonathan Baker, uh, who asks, will Vietnam and other countries accept China's takeover of the South China Sea? I could take a punt at the latter one, and then I think throw the last one back as our finale back to uh, to, to Victor, I, uh, uh, I think. Um, I think that it's very clear that the aim of the what you might call the thin rather than the thick version of the kind of Indo-Pacific strategy of countries that aren't China, I think is the best way to put it, in the region, is a work in progress, but it is definitely moving forward in various ways. Um, if you look at sort of a couple of elements of what happens in the region, things like the emergence of quite unexpected uh, developments such as AUKUS, uh, it's clear along with the more you know, pre-existing uh, groupings such as, such as the Quad, there's clearly a security agenda that comes from what some people call, you know, ARBIS, the rules-based international system um, players, um, that is is always phrased in different ways. But what they really mean is they want to push back against China. It's just that yeah. for those reasons, it can't be phrased in that way. I think what Vietnam and other countries have um, not yet seen and what they would like 
is a combination of cre creating uh, a commercial strategy that enables them in some ways to continue to draw an advantage from China's large market with a security presence that pushes back against China. And this is an extremely difficult combination to achieve for obvious, uh, um, obvious reasons. I think that I call it the thin rather than the thick first and for the following reason. A very great deal of the rhetoric, certainly in the United Kingdom, where two of us are speaking from at the moment, uh, despite, um, if, yes, I was about to say, yes, we've got, um, uh, yeah, sort of American-British mix here, I suppose, but um, there's a British presence here. In the United Kingdom at the moment, and also in the United States, there continues to be quite a lot of talk about democracy, liberty, all of these things, all of which I hasten to add, I think, are wonderful things. I have nothing against either of them and encourage them at all occasions. It's just not very helpful to go pushing these ideas in places like Vietnam, if what you really mean is that you want to be, create a security architecture or even actually an, a commercial and economic architecture for the region in which countries like Vietnam can carry on doing what they're doing um, in safety. And where actually from their point of view, the institution of liberal democratic values, what uh, Prime Minister, British Prime Minister Liz Truss has called, I think the network of liberty, I think is her, her yeah. favorite just may not be a very helpful way to get to that uh, uh, to that end um, end point. Um, I think that you know the China's uh, China's tendency to create facts on the sea, you know the building of complications in the South China Sea has been hard to push back against. But that having been said, it is clear that there is a much stronger interest both in the region and in partners from outside it, including not only North America, but actually perhaps surprisingly now more interest from institutions such as NATO in keeping shipping left lanes open as a global good. And um, I think that the answer to your question is not clear, but uh, if it were, you know, one side or the other, I think would have would have sort of um, uh, leaned into it by now. But I think it's been more actively asked than was the case a generation ago when people thought that essentially the growth of trade would solve everything. And um, it is very evident that that is not what's, uh, what's happened. But anyway, Victor, probably have more on the other one. Uh, yeah, exactly. This is um, go, goes back again and again. You know, this kind of commercial peace theory uh, just just doesn't hold. I mean, most of the time it it works fine, but then when it doesn't work, it doesn't work spectacularly. Uh, so, in terms of um, how is power contested? Uh, so, again, you know, these leverages, control of PLA, control of internal security, um, kind of blackmail. Uh, the other one uh, that was the case, as Susan Schur pointed out in, his, er, in her earlier works, is uh, when the provinces, some of the provinces were very wealthy, they had this kind of fiscal autonomy, which gave them bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis the central government. That is no longer the case for any province in China. So there was a time even sort of um, three years ago, three, four years ago, when uh, consistently you had places like Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangdong running fiscal surpluses. Uh, and then of course the central government leaned on them to transfer a lot of fiscal resources to the poor regions as part of the anti-poverty drive in the past few years. Um, that's no longer the case. All of these places, I believe they all run fiscal deficits now, which means that in order to balance the budgets, they will need transfer payments from the central government or permission from the central government to issue local debt yep. to balance the budget on an annual basis. So given that, you know, there's really no leverage anymore uh, among Politburo members because Xi Jinping controls the military, um, you know, uh, obviously as the head of state controls the budget, uh, even though the day-to-day -day budget uh, is made by a state council, um, Xi Jinping controls internal security, uh, cybersecurity, I, I just don't see a lot of leverage. I mean, there is this normative argument. It's like, oh, well, you know, Sung Ping can come out and push back. I just don't buy that too much. I think without his self-interest. So ultimately, we could see someone not in his faction as the next premier or executive vice premier of China. But I would argue that if we do see that result, it will not be because of leverage of the other actors. It will be because Xi Jinping makes this very self-interested calculation that it serves his interests to have someone not in his faction serving as the next premier or executive vice premier of China. 
All right. Before we actually wrap things up completely, I'll just ask both Rana and Victor if they have any very mundane sort of small predictions. Uh, I have one, which is that when the music plays and the new lineup of the Politburo Standing Committee march into the room, that at least one member of that lineup will fail to clap in rhythm. Not because he doesn't want to, but merely because of a lack of rhythm. But this will be then be interpreted by various observers as having some kind of nefarious or other political meaning, um, if indeed it makes the footage and isn't edited out. So that, that's my mundane prediction for the Party Congress. Any similarly mundane ones from either Victor or Rana? Well, I'll offer you um, also a musically related one, which is not mundane, but bizarre, mm. but who knows? Um, I predict that if we, if the Chinese Communist Party really wanted to push at the edge, then it would do what recently elected British Prime Minister Liz Truss has done and make sure that the seven come on, clapping rhythmically or otherwise, to the sound of moving on up, moving <laughs> on out by the British yes. band M people. <laughs> yeah. Who protested the use of their song, by the way, at the, at the party conference. They did. Well, in this case, about CCP people. Yeah. <laughs> or C people, something like that. I don't know what it would be, the equivalent. But C's well, people. C yeah. people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So, Victor, any, any predictions? Um, so, uh, I think at, toward the beginning of the Congress, Xi Jinping will give a very long speech, uh, which yeah. is three to five hours long. Mm -hmm. When Hu Jintao was Secretary General, people fell asleep, you know, during his speeches. Um, of course, people now uh, don't dare to do it, but uh, I still think we will see one or two people falling asleep if we paid close attention to CCTV coverage. Perhaps Jiang Zemin will fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. I mean, some of these old guys will be there. I, well, I don't know if they will be there for the speech. They'll be there in the opening ceremony. Mm. They'll just walk in, yeah. but maybe they get to walk out and, you know, xiu xi, you know, <laughs> rest in a separate room, uh, but it's just so challenging. You know, it's gonna be a very long speech. I don't know what their trick is, you know, just drink a lot of strong coffee. Or Lots of tea like from the little cups tea. of the holders. Maybe a shot of Mao Tai, you know, initially <laughs> wakes you up, but yeah. after an hour or so may not work so well. Mm. So uh, it's gonna be a challenging time. Even funnier would be if Xi Jinping were to lose his concentration or uh, full well, so energy a, during uh, his own speech he, and make some sort of gaffe or red tintos incorrectly. Correct. Yes. So um, no, no, I'm sure his secretary, secretarial staff will make sure that doesn't happen again. And if it does, it will be edited out of the coverage. I would expect. No? Yes. Yes. Of course. Okay, so thank you both very much, uh, Rana and Victor, uh, for all of your excellent uh, comments and analysis. Uh, I hope that everyone who has joined us uh, found it as useful as I did. Uh, thank you again to everyone and uh, good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.